it's just profound. It's profound. And it's deep, and it's it's moving, and, it, and it's just so creatively told. And the music and the acting so good. And and I'm not saying this to sell the movie. I really think this is one of those movies. I really do. Magnolia, one of my all-time favorite films, and certainly my favorite from Paul Thomas Anderson. Now, maybe it's not your favorite, but we can all admit uh, that it's at least really good. Well, almost all of us. Some people insist on calling Magnolia pretentious and boring. They are wrong. If they gave these labels to Anderson's last couple films, maybe they'd have a point. But they didn't say this about his recent films, they said it about Magnolia. In particular, they didn't like the ending. The film is a mess. I really thought that all of these stories would have come together in some sort of unexpected, synergistic way. There would have been some sort of epiphany Joyce, at the end. The and these stories don't point. come together. It makes no sense. This, I just can't abide. Because Magnolia is a masterpiece. For nearly three hours, we watch all these related stories, all of these characters, thinking that it's all leading to some resolution where they all come together, you know, and, and, and ending with a nice poetic punch that explains what it all means in some easily digestible way. What we get instead is a biblical disaster. Frogs randomly raining down from the sky, forcing the characters into the end of their stories in a way that seems completely out of left field. Oh, the frogs in the sky. But it's not random. It makes perfect sense, at least to me. So here we go. This one's going to be long. I'm going to get in depth. So uh, relax, kick your feet up, and uh, enjoy my interpretation of Magnolia. So what's Magnolia's message? Of course, the most obvious theme of the film is the power of the past. It's about child abuse, and more broadly, the damage that can be caused by one's family or environment. Shit on as a child, and that scars, that hurts. The book says we may be through with the past, but the past ain't through with us. Many of the characters suffer from some sort of trauma or predicament that steered them into being who they are in the present. Many of the characters' arcs involve them facing their past and reaching some sort of reconciliation. Much has been written on this theme, and I agree with much of what I've read, but I think I have a bit more to add. In my opinion, Magnolia isn't just about families and the way the past is always affecting us. It's universal, man. It is evolutional. It is anthropological. It is biological. Oh. I think there's a deeper philosophy here. One that involves not just the past, but the present and the future. It's about fate, free will, cause and effect in general. You are here for me to enlighten you, to edify you, to send you off into the now not so unknown future, not so unknown future. And the crazy experimental ending that all the stupid critics called pretentious is crucial to this, as is the very beginning. Of the film. There is an account of the hanging of three men. They died for the murder of Sir Edmund William Godfrey, husband, father, pharmacist, and all-around gentleman resident of Greenberry Hill, London. He was murdered by three vagrants whose motive was simple robbery. They were identified as Joseph Green, Stanley Berry, and Daniel Hill. Green, Berry, Hill. And I would like to think this was only a matter of chance. Magnolia begins with three quick, true stories of incredibly unlikely events. Events so unlikely, they seem impossible. When telling the first two stories, the narrator says, and I am trying to think this was all only a matter of chance. He acknowledges how unlikely these scenarios are, but refuses to admit that they could be something more something beyond a simple fluke. He's in denial that this is all out of our control and that someone or something is pulling the strings. But by the time he finishes the third and final story, he comes to a troubling realization. And it is in the humble opinion of this narrator that this is not just something that happened. This cannot be one of those things. This was not just a matter of chance. These strange things happen all the time. He admits that Something else is going on here. It's also interesting that even though our narrator tells us these stories are true, well, they're not. 
Either way, many people who've seen Magnolia think these stories are true. It's it's sort of like how Fargo claimed to be a true story, to trick the audience, to to prime them into being easily immersed in the absurd, a, uh, a, a stranger-than-fiction sort of approach. This entire section of Magnolia is very Cohen-esque. Honestly, the whole movie is, at least thematically, philosophically, because like many Cohen films, Magnolia is about cosmic irony. To explain this concept, I'm going to use a clip from a video I made on the use of cosmic irony in Cohen films. I think I did a good job back then, and probably wouldn't be able to explain it this well again, and also, it'll be interesting to see the similarities between Cohen films and Magnolia, which I'll be discussing shortly. But first, cosmic irony, like many other versions of irony, is a tool used in fiction, in storytelling. It occurs when something like a higher power, which could be something like God, or the concept of fate, or a sort of personification of the rules of the universe itself, intervenes to create an ironic situation, an unlikely situation, a situation that gives itself a nice little poetic punch as it unfolds. Cosmic irony is known as irony of fate. It's a force outside of a character's control, interfering in their story. Now this interference can either be actual or inferred, meaning the oddities of the story could actually be supernaturally influenced, or there could be no influence, as long as the cause of the oddities remains ambiguous enough for an argument to be made. A good example of this ambiguity could be the philosophical debate between fate and chance in No Country for Old Men. The film is about whether or not the universe decides the fates of its characters. It explores whether these characters, or really anybody, real or imagined, has any agency at all. The story is perfectly Cohen. It shows the absurdity of life, and it questions the unchangeable paths that suffering people are stuck on, <laughs> with no escape or alteration. And the ending is anticlimactic. The, the bad guy ends up winning, and the good guys end up losing. And, and in terms of the film's theme of fate versus chance, it's near impossible to nail down exactly how it should be interpreted. I mean, it couldn't be more Cohen than that. It's just goddamn beyond everything. What's it mean? What's it leading to? And if you want to explore this topic in more detail, I made an entire video essay about it. But this debate between fate and chance is explored in many of the other Cohen stories. Maybe not as blatantly or from the same angle, but it's definitely there in all of their movies. You see, at first, their stories, these, these absurdist stories, seem to only occur through random chaotic chance, without true purpose, or, nor sometimes even conclusion. But... This randomness that interferes with the characters, it becomes so random, it sparks situations so unlikely, these rare occurrences begin to look less like chance and more like fate, orchestrated by something. If incredibly ironic or even seemingly impossible things happen to a character in a story, which often do, thus leading to a story becoming interesting, it's as if a higher power in control of the story, whether it be God or fate, has acted upon the story to influence the character. Other times, this concept is just blaring out of the screen. Characters break the fourth wall, stories admit to be stories, and sometimes even supernatural characters in control, or, or at least in observance of the film's story, completely aware that it is merely a story, expose themselves to the normal characters. The cowboy and the Big Lebowski and the man who controls the clock and the Hudsucker proxy are basically like God. And then Charlie from Barton Fink is, I don't know, he's like the devil or, or something. But let's get back to Magnolia. To start, the title sequence. Look at all the imagery here. Time, growth, maps. This film is about a lot. Love, regret, forgiveness, human nature, cause and effect. It's about everything. The weather report for the day is shown as text on screen. Of course, this relates to the concept of predeterminism, of things being already decided. Not so unknown future. And yet, if we know anything about the weather, it also tells us that we humans, we, we try our best to guess at what will happen, yet we often get it wrong. The weather, like everything, is out of our control. Sometimes it does some crazy and unlikely things such as pouring rain all day in Los Angeles, a city built in a desert. And according to this film, sometimes it even rains frogs. Magnolia is about extremely unlikely events actually occurring. But more importantly, 
It's about how we have no control over any of it. Oh Lord, why is this happening to me? God, please help me figure it out. I was lost out here. I don't understand why it's happening, God. Please, God. The main story of Magnolia begins with a montage that introduces all the main characters. To the song, one is the loneliest number. Fitting, seeing as how all of them are, at some level, very lonely. But what they are most are victims. Victims of their pasts, victims of their present, victims of cause and effect, of the unfair game all of us play a part in. Probably the best example of this concept here is the character of Donnie. Donnie used to be a child genius, becoming famous by dominating on the game show What Do Kids Know 30 years ago. But he was struck by lightning, causing brain damage, stripping him of his gifted intelligence. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Have you ever been hit by lightning? It doesn't happen to everyone. It's an electrical charge that finds its way across the universe, and it lands in your body and your head. And now I'm just... Stupid. You're so cute when you're on that game show. Bet you can't answer any questions now, though, huh? <laughs> on top of this, his parents stole all of his game show winnings for themselves, essentially abandoning him. And the book says we may be through with the past, but the past is not through with us. This is so fucked, Solomon. I don't deserve this. Don't get strong, Donnie. Now, Donnie is a loser, barely scraping by. He has a crush on Brad, a bartender with braces. Donnie's plan to get Brad to notice him is to go into even more debt and get braces himself. Even though he doesn't need them at all, his, his teeth are fine. To pay for his braces, and most likely to pay off some of his debts, Donnie decides to rob his boss, Solomon. During the robbery, at the end of the film, he smashes his teeth out. I'm sure you all see the cosmic irony. Life. It's not what you hope for. It's not what you deserve. It's what you take. Frank is a controversial pickup artist. Kind of like an Andrew Tate character, but with actual good looks. That is not to say that we don't all need females just as friends, because we're going to learn later in chapter 23 that having a couple of chick friends lying around come in real handy in setting jealousy traps. We'll get to that later. Frank represents the opposing philosophy to the film. Control. It's about finding out what you can be in this world, defining it, controlling it, and saying, I will take what is mine. That in trying to figure out who you are, um, See, you have more important to things to well, put no, myself it's all important, into. Frank. See, the main message of Magnolia is to accept the past and acknowledge that there's nothing you can do to change what's happened. It's about embracing regret, because regret can be a powerful tool moving forward. But Frank's main message is the opposite, or at least that's how he starts out. His self-help speeches are all about forgetting the past, ignoring where you come from and who you are. It's about creating another past and taking control of the future and making your own destiny. Yeah, Mommy wouldn't let me play soccer, and Daddy, oh, he hit me. So that's, that's who I am. That's, that's why I do what I do. I can bullshit. I am the one who's in charge. <laughs> I am the one who says yes, yeah. no, no, now. Most of his clients are pathetic men who truly have no chance of getting the women they want, so Frank sells them a philosophy that they want to hear, that he wants to hear, that people aren't defined by the things out of their control, that if men want something or want to be something, all they have to do is act. Frank wants to influence everything around him, and yet, refuses to be influenced in return. Him walking out on stage to Thus Spoke Zarathustra speaks volumes here. I'm Superman, I'm like a... He kind of sees himself as a god. In a way, it seems like he thinks he can even control time. That's right, you're gonna mark the calendar. You're gonna mark that calendar. It is gonna make all the difference in your world. And on the 1st of May, and come June, oh ho, come on again. Stick with this calendar, you're gonna work with it, you're gonna set goals. Facing the past is an important way of not making progress. This is something I tell my men over and over and over. Frank has been successfully running away from his past and preaching the gospel of reinvention for years, but tonight, Frank is interviewed by a tough journalist. Frank's past, his real past, reaches out and forces him to acknowledge it. 
Well, I was wondering about the weather department. Uh -huh. I was wondering whether or not the weather people have outside meteorological services or if they have in-house instruments. Like Donnie all those years ago, Stanley is now a boy genius competing on the same game show, What Do Kids Know? Stanley seems to know everything, but he's also miserable. His parents use and abuse him much like Donnie's. You have to be subtly abusive so they don't know what's happening. Come on, Stanley. I need to go to the bathroom. Jesus Christ, Stanley, you can't go to the bathroom now. You have exactly one minute. Right when Stanley's about to set a record win streak, he pees his pants on live TV. I don't know. He pissed his pants. Jesus, Stanley, what the fuck did you do that for? Like his IQ and his parents, it was out of his control. The showrunners wouldn't let him take a bathroom break, ensuring that eventually it was going to happen. What, well, I'm made to feel like, like a freak? If I answer questions? Or I'm smart? Or I have to go to the bathroom? Whether it's bladders or clouds in the sky, water goes in, water goes out. Cause and effect. What is that? I'm asking, I'm asking you that. I'm not sure, Stanley. In the moment of the film, during the game show, where Stanley talks back to Jimmy and refuses to answer the questions, it seems that Stanley is resisting his fate. He is a child prodigy. It seems that it is his destiny to play this game. But in this moment, Stanley refuses. It seems Stanley is taking control of his own life. But near the end of the film, it seems Stanley goes back on this. Stanley breaks back into the library and goes right back to studying, right back to the books, right back to what he's been doing this entire time. Stanley tries to take control, but in the end he succumbs to his destiny. Although, at the very end of the film, Stanley does stand up to his abusive father, but only for a moment. Dad, you need to be nicer to me. Go to bed. His father gives no response to his pleas, and instead, tells Stanley to go back to bed, which he does. Kids! Jimmy Gator is the host of this game show. At the same moment that Stanley pees his pants, Jimmy collapses on stage. He has terminal cancer. He's had a long and successful career as a TV personality. The world loves him, but his own daughter, Claudia, hates him. All Jimmy wants to do is reconcile with his daughter before he dies but she refuses to speak to him. His past actions have consequences. It's metastasized in my bones. Fuck it's, you! Claudia, it's, uh, I'm not lying to you. This is the truth. I'm telling you, I, I, Claudia, I'm going to lose. Get out. It seems like the story is cruel to Jimmy until we realize that he molested his daughter. He molested Claudia. I think she thinks that I may have molested her. Did you ever touch her? When we consider he's been hosting a show for 30 years in Hollywood that features children, a sickening theory can easily be reached. The show being named What Do Kids Know might not be a coincidence. Please. You deserve to die alone for what you've done. I don't know what I've done. Yes, you do! Just say it, whatever it is, and I'll listen to you. You don't know how fucking stupid I am. It's okay. I got troubles, okay? I started this, didn't I? Didn't I? Fuck? Jimmy's daughter, Claudia, is clearly damaged. She's a drug addict and is used by men constantly. This is typical behavior for someone who's been through what Claudia has. She sees herself as unlovable. That is, until Officer Jim comes into her life. Strangely enough, Officer Jim has the same first name as her father. And I might get 20 bad calls a day, but one time I can help someone, then I'm a happy cop. Jim is a typical man looking for love. He's good and decent, and he's a good Christian who prays. And God, I'm telling you right now, I will not screw it up. You gave me an opportunity. He's a police officer who, despite having authority, is constantly told what to do and made to be a fool. Whoa, whoa. You wanna know who killed that guy? Come here. No! I'm here. He discovers a murder, and then a child, Dixon, raps a song that says exactly what happened, but Jim doesn't listen. He just scolds Dixon for swearing. You better just shut the fuck up! I've had enough with the mouth and the language. I'm the prophet, the professor. I'm gonna teach you about the worm. And if he's worth being hurt, he's worth bringing pain in. When the sunshine don't work, the good Lord be in the rain in. Okay. 
Whatever that meant. Did you listen to me? I told you who did it, and you're not even listening to me. Be cool. Stay in school. Later, it pours rain on him, and someone shoots at him, causing him to drop his gun. Dixon appears, takes the gun, and then vanishes with it, meaning Jim is in trouble. But he finds comfort in meeting and falling for Claudia. I'll tell you everything, and maybe we can get through all the piss and shit and lies that kill other people. Huh. Piss and shit. <laughs> you really use strong language. On their date, he begins to scold Claudia for swearing, just like he did Dixon, but then apologizes and realizes he needs to start listening to people more. No, I'm sorry. No, it's nothing. I'm sorry. He admits to Claudia that he hasn't been on a date in three years, ever since his divorce, which clearly left him a bit damaged. I lost my gun today. What? I lost my gun today when I left you, and I'm the laughing stock of a lot of people. I feel like a fool. You want to kiss me, Jim? Yes, I do. <laughs> now that I've met you, would you object to never seeing me again? What? No. Just say no. Wait, Claudia. Go, what is it? What is it? Please. Okay, just let me go. Please. He's dying. He's fucking dying as we're sitting here. I mean, there's not a fucking... Jesus, how can you tell me to calm down? I don't know what I'm doing. I do things and I fuck up. Linda is the trophy wife to Earl, a successful producer who is now dying of cancer. She is racked by guilt for she only married him for his money and cheated on him constantly. But now, in his final days of life, she has grown to actually love her husband. Out of guilt, she wants to change the will so she doesn't get any of the money. I don't want him to die. I didn't love him when we met, and I, I did so many bad things to him that he doesn't know, or things that I want to confess to him. But, but now I do. I love him. She has pure liquid morphine to give Earl, to put him out of his misery, but she can't bring herself to kill him. She leaves and takes a handful of pills in her car, attempting suicide. But before she dies, she's discovered by Dixon, who calls an ambulance. Linda tries to take control of her own life, even if that means ending it. She makes the decision to end it. But her decision, her sense of control, is shown to be just an illusion. Mistakes like this, you make some, and okay. Not okay sometimes. You make other ones. One of Earl's past projects that added to his wealth was the show What Do Kids Know? He's a few stages ahead of the show's host, Jimmy, and by that I mean his cancer has taken him right up to death's door. Goddamn regret. The goddamn regret. On his deathbed, of course his major regrets in life now plague him. He constantly cheated on his first wife, and the love of his life, and mother of his children. And worse than this, when she became terminally ill, he abandoned her and left his only son to take care of her while she withered away. His son hasn't spoken to him in ten years. Earl's dying wish is to see his son one last time. His nurse, Phil, helps him on this quest. Phil tracks down Earl's son, who turns out to be none other than Frank. Say no! You will not control me, no! You will not take my soul, no! You will not win this game! The most useless thing in the world is that which is behind me. Chapter 3. Even though Frank has been claiming the past is irrelevant, he is defined by the pain his father put him through. It's what he uses to manipulate not only the countless women, but his gullible fans. But due to both the interviewer and Phil's pressuring, Frank finally faces his past. <laughs> Frank's arc kind of carries with it the message of the movie. It resolves the debate between accepting your past and running from it. Don't let anyone ever say to you, you shouldn't regret anything. You regret what you fucking want. Use that regret for anything, any way you want. You can use it, okay? Magnolia tells us to acknowledge and accept the uncaring sequences of cause and effect. There's no running from it, and it's not going to stop, so give up. So just give up. Frank finally does and decides to visit his father, but unfortunately, when he arrives, Phil has already given Earl the liquid morphine, so Frank can't get the closure he was hoping for. But the thudding of something falling from the sky 
miraculously causes Earl to wake up and see his son one last time before passing, thus granting both of the men the moment they needed. The thudding noise is the frogs falling from the sky. And of course, they fall across the entire city, affecting every main character of the film. For instance, right as Jimmy is about to kill himself, to spare himself the pain of the cancer as well as the guilt of what he's done, the frogs crash through his ceiling, causing him to not take the easy way out, to live, at least for now, with what he's done and who he is. You can't run from regret, you must face it. Claudia is able to accept or at least admit what her father has done to her. When the frog storm hits, she finally confides in her mother, allowing her to comfort her. While robbing his boss, Solomon, the frogs fall on Donnie, knocking him to the ground and knocking his teeth out. But he's rescued by Officer Jim, who then convinces Donnie to return the money. Jim's lost gun also falls from the sky, meaning this storm of frogs not only allowed Jim to do his one good thing, it also saved him from being fired and probably gave him the courage to go back to Claudia in the end. These frogs falling from the sky are what wrap up all the stories. Many critics didn't like this. They see this ending as a pretentious cop-out. Rather than tying up all the stories in a realistic way, the movie pulls the rug out and does something fantastical. Great episodes and these great movie and these great performances, and it's all great, but I don't know what to do with it. Where do I go for the last... 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, how do I have a climax here that brings it all together? <laughs> what are you, what are you? <laughs> no, you know, the funny thing is what you're hinting towards is actually one of the first things that came into my brain. Um, it, it, um, how it comes together at the end? Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's not an afterthought. In other words, it's not an afterthought. <laughs> the implication is that writer P.T. Anderson just didn't have a good way to end the story, so he cheated. But this was always how he wanted to end the story. Because this event, these frogs falling from the sky, it really is the main way all of these stories are related. Not necessarily the frogs themselves, but what the frogs represent. The lack of control, of agency, the unpredictability and absurdity of life. These characters are haunted by their pasts, imprisoned in their present, having no control over who they are or what's happening to them. Having something supernatural like this occur to all of them at once is, in my opinion, the best way to show their acceptance of their lack of control. Whether the ending makes sense or not, it is the ending. It isn't up to the characters, it's up to the author. I think the point here, or at least something the film wants us to ponder, is that there really isn't a difference between an ending that's sensible and predictable and one that seems bizarre or unearned. The end is the end. Fate is fate. People get cancer, kids get molested, geniuses get struck by lightning. All of these things are out of our control. They change us. They become yet another puppet string that forces us to dance across the stage. This ending isn't pretentious. It's genius. Now before completely switching gears in the video here, I want to point out a couple little touches that this movie makes that I, uh, that I really appreciate. I love the minor character of Frank's assistant. Here we see him talking to a bunch of Frank's fans. He's talking about trying to seduce or at least manipulate a feminist. He acts as if he's done this, as if he's so cool and macho that he can even seduce all the boss bitches out there. What I love is that he then gets a phone call from his boss, who happens to be a woman. And she completely shits on him, and he just takes it. Get him off the elevator, Janet. And how she says good boy to him, as if he's a dog. This relates to one of my favorite little secret hidden Easter egg things in this movie. It relates to dogs. Biological. Oh, it is animal. There are many little clues throughout the movie that show Frank to be a dog. He is drawn as a dog on his poster. He makes panting noises here like a dog before his interview. Okay. Calm down. Take it easy and be a good boy. And even when he begins to break down at his father's side, he, uh, he, he kind of sounds like a dog. 
what I find interesting here is that at the end of the movie, once Frank has had his arc and decides to finally face his past, he wants nothing to do with the dogs. And Phil, I will drop kick the fucking dogs if they come near me. He hates the dogs, even though the movie has been telling us that he is one. And at the very end of the movie, once Frank has reached the complete end of his arc, one of the dogs is dead. It's almost as if it died to symbolize that side of Frank. Or maybe all this dog stuff is just a coincidence, but I felt like pointing it out. So, all right, let's change gears and get into the really complex stuff in Magnolia. Do you have love in your heart? I have love all over. I even have love for you, friend. I think another reason this film gets called pretentious is due to some of its dialogue. Due to so many different characters uncharacteristically saying profound things. It's a dangerous thing to confuse children with angels. But something the critics fail to understand here is that this too serves a purpose. To understand why we first have to realize that there's a sort of self-awareness to this film, as if it's admitting that its characters are characters, thus breaking the illusion of a naturally progressing story and instead using cosmic irony as a sort of puppeteer. Because I'm not a toy. I'm not a doll. I'm going to start rolling now. What? Well, I thought we were rolling. And I know that I might sound ridiculous, like this is the, the scene of the movie where the guy's trying to get a hold of the long lost son, you know, but this is that scene. This is that scene. This is so boring, so goddamn, you know, that, that guy in Wish and all that old man on a bed. Oh, God. This is a long way to go with no punch. <laughs> a little moral regret that you make and there's something you take and the blah, blah, blah. Something, something. Give me a cigarette. <sighs> you know, but this is that scene. This is that scene. And I think they have those scenes in movies because they're true. You know, because they really happen. Many of the characters being introduced on a television set is a clue to this fourth wall breaking self-awareness. When Jim is introduced, he's talking to himself, as if being interviewed on an episode of Cops. He has rehearsed his lines, even though he has no one to say them to. And of course, the movie ends with Claudia looking directly at the camera and smiling. Uh, quick recap for those who don't know. Round one. And then there's the part near the end of the film, right as every main character is about to take action, where, where all of them, on their own, decide to sing the song, Wise Up. Let's look at some of the lyrics to this song. It's not what you thought when you first began it. You got what you want, now you can hardly stand it. Though by now you know you're sure there's a cure, and you have finally found it. You think one drink will shrink you till you're underground and living down, but it's not going to stop, it's not going to stop, so just give up. As perfectly symbolic as these lyrics are, of course this scene doesn't really make sense logically. Why would all of these people all decide to sing the same song at the same time? Well, because the movie told them to, and the movie is trying to admit to us that it has this command. See, this is the, the scene of the movie where you help me out. So when the characters speak, they aren't just speaking to others in the scene. They seem to be broadcasting the philosophy of the film directly to the audience. In this big game that we play, life, it's not what you hope for, it's not what you deserve. So much violence. That's the way of the world. Good luck, as always. Serve, protect, and all that other blah, blah, blah. People think if I make a judgment call that that's a judgment on them, but that is not what I do. And that's not what should be done. I have to take everything and play as it lays. How do we do this thing? Well, we just do it. We do it. We figure it out. We do as we do, I guess. There, there are things that, 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 uh, that God, the, the puppet master of the universe, the, the screenwriter, wants the audience to consider. And these characters are his antennas. That's another thing that goes memory timelines you, you know what next what happens then what next you need to realize that um, 
Once you give it to them, there really is no going back. I, well, what the fuck can I say to that? I don't know what to say to that. Life ain't short, it's long. It's long, God damn it. You are here for me to enlighten you into the now not so unknown future, so come along with me. The narrator of the opening film is Ricky Jay, the same man who plays the showrunner with the Freemasons ring. Also, his quote here. We met upon the level and were parting on the square is a common saying among Freemasons, the group who some still think run the world. We met upon the level and we're parting on the square. I'm not fucking sleeping. The showrunner saying this must have some sort of implication. What's interesting is how Jimmy responds to this saying. He says, I'm not fucking sick, Bert, even though he is sick. At this point in the movie, Jimmy hasn't told anyone that he's sick. The audience doesn't even know. Somehow, the showrunner knew that Jimmy was sick. The showrunner seems to know a lot of things. He makes the entertainment for both the audiences in the film watching the game show and also the audiences watching the real film itself. It's a dangerous thing to confuse children with angels. Something that happens. Something that happens. And the book says we may be through with the past, but the past is not through with us. And no, it is not dangerous to confuse children with angels. Some of the children in the film certainly know more than the adults. Stanley seems to know everything, even acting unsurprised by the frogs, <laughs> even saying the same line as the narrator at the beginning of the film. Something that happened. This cannot be one of those things. Maybe this is why the show is called What Do Kids Know? Because another kid in the film, Dixon, clearly is supernatural or, or something special. He seems to know everything. He knew exactly where Lydia would be and saves her life. And then there's his rap song. Let's take a look at the lyrics to that as well. Presence, with a double ass meaning, gifts I bestow. With my riff and my flow, but you don't hear me though. He's saying his words will mean something deeper, if only Jim would listen to him. Think fast, think fast, catch me, yo, because I throw what I know with a resonance for your trouble-ass fiend in weaning yourself off the back of the shelf. The fiend is Claudia. She's weaning Jim off the back of the shelf by either being the thing that takes him out of being single, sad, and lonely, or by giving him the confidence to be a better cop. Jackass, crackers, body stackers, dick tooting, I'm not gonna say that, masturbating to your triggers. Living to get older with a chip on your shoulder, except you think you got a grip because your hip got a holster. These insults could apply to many different characters, or, or maybe they're just nonsense, or, or a combination of both. My guess, at least, is that Phil is the body stacker, because he takes care of the dead and dying. The, uh, the, uh, the, the dick tutors could, could, be, could be Linda. She literally says that she sucks cock. Uh, masturbating to triggers could be all about Jim and the police reliant on their guns. O or this is all just filler to sound more, you know, rap-like. Ain't no confessor, so Buster, you better just shut the fuck up. Try to listen and learn. Check that ego. This could be about Frank or Jimmy or Earl. All have power and egos and like to talk. Frank never really confesses anything, so that could be what Dixon means by no confessor. Whereas Jimmy and Earl do confess, but maybe Dixon is saying the severity of their crimes makes the confession a waste of breath. Come off it. I'm the prophet. The professor. I'm a teach about the worm, who eventually turned to catch wreck with the neck of a long-time oppressor. When he says, I'm the prophet, he means uh, he himself, Dixon, is the prophet. But the professor line makes me think he is also Stanley. Uh, both Dixon and Stanley seem to be enlightened uh, in full understanding of what's happening in the story. When he says that he'll teach you about the worm, he's talking about the crime in the film. The crime that Jim should be trying to solve, but ignores. The worm is the man who committed the murders at Dixon's mother's house. It was cut from the movie, but supposedly the worm is revealed to be Dixon's father. There's a common theme between Stanley and Frank and Claudia all standing up to their abusive fathers. My guess is that in Dixon's cut storyline, uh, if it were in the movie, he would have used the gun he stole from Officer Jim to kill the worm, being yet another character to stand up to his father, his long-term oppressor. And he's running from the devil, but the dead is always gaining. And if he's worth being hurt, he's worth bringing pain in. 
When the sunshine don't work, the good lord bring the rain in. Running from the devil with debt gaining is about Donnie. Donnie is in debt, and also seems to have a little devil on his shoulder telling him to lash out of the world for screwing him over, putting him up to uh, ridiculous, evil ideas like robbing his boss. Worth being hurt, worth bringing pain in can be about either of the old men who are deservedly suffering. By sunshine not working, he could mean that the people aren't being enlightened like they should be. They're not understanding the fact that they have no control. So, to make them understand, he will have to bring the rain in. He will have to bring about a storm. The frogs. Yeah, so Dixon knows a lot. <laughs> On top of knowing the future and the lives of every major character in the movie, remember he's also the one who took the gun from Jim, and yet somehow it gets returned by falling from the sky. A simple explanation for this is that in Magnolia's universe, Dixon is like an angel. He's attached to, or, or is God, somehow. But what I at least think this means on a deeper level is that Dixon is an agent of the story itself. And so is his mother. Like Dixon, she refuses to listen to Officer Jim's commands, but she tells him exactly where to look for the bodies. Action by action, she spurs him along in the plot. Getting back to uh, religious themes, the number 82 is hidden all over the film. This is because in the Bible, Exodus 8-2 reads, If you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. This is making sense. This is making a lot of sense. I give you a fucking chance and a chance over and over you let me down! Donnie's wealthy boss with a safe full of money is named Solomon, the name of the king of Israel who is said to have had a mine of gold. And the devious old man Donnie talks to in the bar seems to know something more. Yeah, you got struck by lightning at one. But you're all right now. So what's the what? What? He seems to be a bit too classy for the place, and speaks in only riddles and poetry. Who was it that said a man of genius has seldom been ruined but by himself? Lovely, you might get up. hurt. Mind your own business! Gently, son! When the Supertramp song, Goodbye Stranger, is playing in the bar, this man is shown right as the lyric, The Devil is My Savior, is heard. He seems devilish. Shall we drink to that? Which matches up with Dixon's line in his rap song. Things go round and round, don't they? Yes, they do. They do. Like I said before, it's as if some of the characters exist to do the screenwriter's bidding. Which, I guess, is what all characters do when you think about it, but with this film it's more apparent, and, and it's for a purpose. The film is giving us signals in every shot, every line, every character. See, this is the, the scene of the movie where you help me out. I could go through it and find countless examples. I could find so much evidence for this theme, but this video is already long enough. But there, there is one more thing that I want to talk about, one more character, and that's Phil, the nurse. Even though Phil is considered a main character, he's different than all the other main characters. He doesn't really have a backstory or really any drama at all in his own life like the others do. It's like he doesn't have his own life, or own identity. Phil is only there to be a caretaker, a helper. In this interview, Philip Seymour Hoffman is asked what he found attractive about the character of Phil, what, what he liked about the character. Partially joking, but also not, this was his answer. Because his outfit is so cool. Uh, because his hair is not cut just right. It's a little too long. Did you notice that? Um, uh, he flosses. Um, what attracted me to Phil Farmer was that he's really, really, really nice guy and that he has a moral structure that is beyond the call of duty, that is beyond what most people... While it's not explicit, I see the character of Phil possibly being similar to Dixon, as in he does whatever is necessary to progress the story. Linda couldn't bear to be the one to give Earl the morphine. She didn't want to euthanize him. She couldn't play God. But it's Phil's job to play God. So he ends up giving her all the morphine, killing him. And remember, he also kills the dog. <laughs> Phil also makes all the connections to unite Frank and Earl. Phil makes massive decisions that further the plot far more often than any of the other main characters. 
maybe Phil is kind of like an angel character as well. With his blonde hair and cherub face, he definitely looks angelic. Or maybe I just think this because of how much I love Philip Seymour Hoffman. And and, and also, wow, like Phil is played by a guy named Phil. I, I mean, the part was written specifically for Philip Seymour Hoffman, so there's no way this is a coincidence. Maybe this plays into the whole theme of self-awareness as well. Who knows? Also, maybe this fits into the theme of blurring the line, or maybe it doesn't, but Paul Thomas Anderson's father died of lung cancer in 1997. His name was Ernie, and he was a TV personality involved in show business uh, in general. There was so much happening uh, in my life at the time, and I was just going through so much. Um, uh, sort of personal things, you know, that, that... Ernie, Earl, lung cancer, and then in an interview, Hoffman accidentally makes this slip up. I think, you know what, Phil? He's showing up at work at Earl Anderson's house. You know, um, Earl Partridge's house. you got to cut the Anderson out. <laughs> Earl Partridge's house, and... Uh, Families are just endless, juicy ammunition for great stories, you know? They're never going to let you down for, for good drama or, or, or good comedy. So, yeah, maybe this film is more autobiographical than we think. Okay, so to summarize, every main character except Phil, has past traumas and past mistakes that puppet the pain of the present. That, uh, that sentence had too many P's. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll think it was poetic and think highly of me, or, or maybe you'll judge me and say it's bad writing. I'd like you to like it, but uh, how you feel about my writing isn't up to me. And, and honestly, it isn't up to you either. You don't choose what foods you like. You don't choose what people you love. You don't choose anything. Things happen to you and they change you. It's all just cause and effect, the one and only tool of an uncaring universe. The rules of the universe, you know, you know, nature personified, our author of cause and effect, he doesn't like to make himself known. He isn't flashy. He doesn't turn water into wine and he doesn't make it rain frogs. He doesn't draw attention to himself, at least not most of the time. But this is good because it gives us the feeling of being behind the wheel. And the illusion works for most of us, because most of us haven't been struck by lightning. Most of us haven't won the lottery. Most of us are never given a reason to think that the universe has a strong opinion of us one way or the other. It's rare to feel like the cosmic spotlight is on us. But in reality, it's always on us. It's just easy to forget this in the moments when it isn't raining frogs. But it's always raining frogs. Everything is raining frogs. Raining frogs decided your genes, your environment, your worst fears, and your happiest memories. It's all out of control. All of it. Every single thing is just one of those things. But this still leads back to the same question. The question at the heart of so many beautiful pieces of art like this movie. Probably because it's the question at the heart of consciousness itself. Is it all a stream of random freak occurrences? Or is it planned out? I think they're one and the same, but it really doesn't matter. If it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain. Maybe it'll be water, maybe it'll be frogs. Either way, you have no say in the matter. If you can accept this, then you will be happier and more carefree than you ever thought possible. You'll be more thankful for gifts and less bothered by misfortune. It is what it is. What happened, happened. And it happened in the one and only way it ever could have. It's done, there's no changing it and it's not going to stop. Hey, thanks for watching. Hopefully, uh, <sighs> uh, hopefully some of this made uh, some sense. Anyway, like and subscribe and uh, share the video. You know, I post a video, I get like 50 views. It's, it's uh, getting difficult to, uh, you know, to, to want to keep trying, you know? But I will, because uh, uh, the, the few views and the few, you know, nice comments that I do get, they, uh, it makes it worth it, so. Thank you.